globalization could mean many things, but it is not the globalization of humanity. It is the globalization of markets, it's economic globalization, it's corporate globalization, and through it, corporations are gaining control of the world affairs. They're transforming each of us into a commodity, our lives into a commodity, which means dehumanization. It means less globalization of humanity. Uh, the most important changes that have taken place in Indian agriculture in the last one and a half decades is first and foremost the disappearance of the beautiful diversity of this country. India is a land of diversity and here on this farm we are trying to conserve some of that diversity. But India is being pushed into a land of monocultures because globalization means monoculture. Secondly, as global corporations take control over agriculture, they sell costly seeds, costly chemicals to the farmers. Farmers are get into a debt trap, and the debt trap is pushing them into suicides. 200,000 farmers have committed suicide in India since 1997. And as agriculture has shifted from being part of a culture, from being part of a livelihood, from being part of providing the basic need of food, and is linked to global markets, which is what globalization is aimed at doing, hunger emerges on a larger scale. Per capita consumption in India has dropped from 178 to 150 kilograms per year. Every second and third child is today hungry in this country. India is the capital of hunger, with 214 million people not getting adequate food. And this crisis will go deeper this year because of the severe drought, we work in 16 states of the country. Our farmers' reports are showing us there's a quarter production, half production compared to normal. We are going to see a very severe food crisis and this vulnerability has increased as a result of globalization. Would you... Really? Maharashtra is the land where Gandhi Seva set up Seva Gram, which means the village of service, spun Khadi to get this country independence. It's the land where cotton got domesticated. It's the land where research on cotton was most advanced. We have 1,500 cotton varieties that are still conserved in the Cotton Research Institute in Nagpur in Maharashtra. But because this was the capital of cotton, this is where Monsanto arrived with its BT cotton seeds. It took the price from 7 rupees to 1,700 rupees. In a few years, it has pushed 4,000 farmers every year to suicide. It controls 400,000 acres under BT cotton. Monsanto's monopoly has created a disaster in the heart of cotton in India. Reproduction is as ancient as life itself, but species reproduced within species, rice reproduced within rice. Genetic engineering allows you to cross species boundaries, splice a gene from a bacteria and put it into a plant, splice a gene from a human being and put it into an animal. This creation of transgenics is what is called genetic engineering. Really? The three key impacts of genetic engineered crops and foods. The first is they're untested. They're mixing genes of bacteria and viruses and cancers to give us food. But food with untested viruses can create super viruses. The SARS could be linked to the viruses of the native gut interacting with the virus of the promoters in soya bean. H1N1 virus. How come we have pig genes of the the genes of the pig virus, the chicken virus, and the human virus, all in one. Um, these untested risks are creating new diseases. They can create future hazards. There's a clear environmental impact of contamination, of pollution. As these genes spread into the environment, diversity is contaminated. We are used to seeing physical pollution. 
We also have become familiar with chemical pollution, but the latest risk is genetic pollution. And finally, the economic cost. There's only one reason genetic engineering is being done, and that is for the companies to cre collect super profits. They could not collect royalties from our seeds, so they do genetic engineering. And by collecting royalties, they push farmers into debt and to suicide. Um, India, thank goodness, is a very large country with more than 600 million people living in rural areas. Uh, it's only cotton that has so far been approved for commercial planting because of legal cases we have fought. I started fighting Monsanto in 1998 in the courts of India and they haven't been able to sell us genetically engineered foods. Um, in terms of percentages, it would be a very, very tiny percent, less than 1%. But in terms of the damage, it's very significant. Really? Gandhi's challenging of the salt laws in 1930 and his doing the salt march is something that has inspired us in Navdanya. We have been doing a bead satyagraha since 1991 when the government was first pressurized to start adopting the kind of laws that were being introduced by the companies into the GATT, which became the World Trade Organization, and gave us the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement. The first drafts came out in 91, and immediately we started the Beach Satyagraha. I have undertaken three Beej marches, three seed marches across the country to distribute seeds, to declare seeds as a common heritage, and to declare that just as Gandhi did not obey the salt laws, we will not obey patent laws on seed. seed is a gift of nature. Seed is a gift of humanity and our ancestors. We must pass it on in freedom to our future generations. We will not obey patent laws, just as Gandhi refused to obey the uh, salt laws of the British. Even though the corporations had the aim of having the entire world transgenic in 2000, which is why I started Navdanya in 1987 to defend an alternative, I can say with hope, with pride, with confidence that only five to six countries have been captured by these companies. Canada, US, Brazil, Argentina. The companies haven't been able to enter China, though they are transgenics in China, because corporations aren't allowed to enter the seed sector. In India, they've only been able to capture the cotton market. Most of the world is still GMO-free. Most of the crops of the world are still GMO-free. In India, we have a movement where 6,000 villages are GMO-free. I work with governments in Europe. 50 regions of Europe are officially declared GMO-free, and I have a legally binding agreement with them that they will not bend to the pressure of the European Commission. They will not bend to the pressure of the World Trade Organization. They will only bend to the pressure of their people and nature's laws. The most important aspect about water privatization is that water is the lifeblood of the planet. Every plant needs water, every animal needs water, every human being needs water. Privatization means you must get your water through a market. Are the plants going to say, give me water in a marketplace of Suez and Vivendi? Are the poor going to put out 12 rupees for every bottle of water to quench their thirst. Privatization means the death of the planet. Privatization means the denial of the human right of the poor to stay alive. Biodiversity is the expression of life on this planet. This diversity is the source of healing, it's the source of nutrition. This is what the corporations are seeking. Just as they are privatizing water, they would like to privatize biodiversity. They would like to own plants. And we have had to fight many, many cases of patenting of plants, the neem, the basmati, the wheat, the biopiracy of our biological heritage is something we do not accept. Really? We have done studies for our National Commission of Women on the impact of globalization on women. Now, women's economy has been about sustaining society, providing water, providing food. This is exactly what globalization assaults. 
as Coca-Cola starts to provide privatized water, women must walk longer, which is why the women of Plachimada said no more. We will not accept Coca-Cola because we must have water. As women's lands are taken away to put factories and luxury housing, women's livelihoods are destroyed. Women's capacity to feed their children is destroyed. Women's hunger increases and malnutrition increases. Just this morning in the newspaper, I was reading about a woman who's taken her life because she could not see her two daughters going hungry. The rich countries of today, the northern countries, are those who, on the basis of colonization, transfer the wealth of the south to the north. Today they continue to accumulate wealth for their corporations. They do it by promoting the privatization of water, where companies like Swayze and Vivendi and Bechtel are starting to own the water of our rivers and our wells and sell it back to us. People become poorer if Monsanto's patents take all the wealth of the farmers away, leave them in poverty, leave them with suicide, and the coffers of Monsanto increase. People are poorer as the subsidies of Europe, of the common agriculture policy, are collected by corporations to dump cheap products on the third world. They dump milk. Our women, who are dairy keepers, cannot sell the milk at a proper price. They must sell off their buffaloes, they must sell off their cows. Our wheat cannot be sold in the market if wheat is dumped. Our oil cannot be sold in the market if oil is dumped. The combination of big subsidies, a free trade regime, the removal of quantitative restrictions is a disaster for the third world. But it does not serve the people of the rich north either. It only serves the corporations of the rich north. Really? Monsanto is the name of a village in Italy and it means the holy mountain but Monsanto the company is the unholy corporation, a killer corporation that first made Agent Orange now is selling contaminated toxic GMO seeds taking patents and pushing farmers to suicides. I would call it a killer corporation. Entropy is the waste of energy. It is the constant use of energy that is holding life together, burning it up, using it up to then create dissipated energy that is not useful but is just there as pollution in the air giving us climate change. For us food sovereignty is food Swaraj in the very Gandhian perspective. Swaraj means self-governance. In the area of food self-governance means the right to have your seed, the freedom to grow the crops that you want to grow, the methods you want to grow them with, the freedom of a society to fix a just price for the food that is sold. And finally, the freedom of the eater to be able to have good food, diverse food, food according to your culture, and not be force-fed with genetically modified organisms. We are being molded into being inhabitants of a consumer marketplace. We are being reduced to commodities. Everything in life is being reduced to commodities. But on this path, humanity has just 100 years more than extinction, like so many other species have gone extinct, we too will be extinct. If humanity has to have a future, it must reclaim its humanity. And it can only do that by reclaiming our lives from the market, from commodification. To do that, we must once again become Earth citizens. We must once again become part of this beautiful planet. Then the planet has the generosity to support us forever. Really? We are living in a real dictatorship. We are living in a dictatorship of five corporations controlling food, five corporations controlling water, five corporations controlling seed. This is not democracy. Today.